Okay, this is the Pacific Planetarium Seminar on Friday, March 30th, and we're going to start out with our presenter, Ryan Wyatt, who really needs no introduction for most of those present, uh, but for the record, he's the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. Ryan. Well, thank you. And uh, I think what I was interested in talking about today is by, a, it's actually a talk that I've given for a while called What is Viz, although uh, it gets constantly tweaked and updated, but it's sort of a kind of personal perspective on really what is visualization and how can we uh, use visualization in our various contexts, but in this case, of course, planetariums. Uh, as effectively as possible. And uh, the, uh, the role that I have here at the Academy, although you can see as Director of Morris and Planetarium, the other part of my role is actually uh, in science visualization in terms of working with video artists mostly, but also uh, in general people who create visuals for public consumption, both on the Academy's exhibit space and also uh, for our various online channels and things like that. And some of the other things I do around this, uh, I actually am the uh, co-chair of a, of a conference, uh, a biannual conference called the Gordon Research Conference on Visualization and Science and Education that brings together people who think about how to uh, communicate clearly with visualizations. And uh, I've also actually started doing talks at data visualization conferences, things that like business and tech people go to. So I'm trying to like learn also from what others are doing in the visualization realm in hopes of translating that back into the planetarium world. Now I think that's critical in the planetarium world because we are at this interesting juncture now where we, particularly with uh, data to dome, uh, are, are looking at with our digital planetariums in particular, the kind of vast array of data and concepts that we can convey visually and we are more and more empowered to create visualizations based on data that are made available through different channels and and even if we're not creating those visualizations then being able to selectively choose visualizations and visual representations that are going to be easiest for our public to understand uh, i think is also a critical skill that we need to develop within the community so the general outline is I'd like to kind of give this personal perspective on some just basic thoughts on visual representation uh, in, uh, in, in the context of planetariums and, and outside. Uh, and, then, uh, and then share some kind of case studies and, uh, and then resources uh, that, that uh, I particularly like. So uh, moving on from the Data to Dome page, I, I, the, as I said, I've given this talk for quite a while. So I actually started giving it back when I worked at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And it was inspired by my title, actually. I was um, trying very hard to get hired by the American Museum of Natural History. And finally, it was only toward the end of the process that I was told what my title would be. I wasn't applying for a specific job. Instead, we kind of created this position and the title that they had come up with me for me was science visualizer and I kind of looked at that title and wondered exactly what that meant I would be doing I sort of envisioned that I would be sitting in my office like with incense burning and uh, you know sort of visualizing science and, uh, and uh, <laughs> really wondering kind of what that really meant and, and in order to kind of make that joke in a presentation I, I did a Google search as you do for an image that would kind of help illustrate that and I came up with actually not this image but a similar image uh, and for uh, to avoid copyright infringement I just made my own but it was a picture of Ganesh uh, hovering in front of this image of the Pleiades and uh, I thought well it's kind of funny but then as I looked at it and thought about it um, I realized that there's sort of a deeper meaning here uh, and that's what I'll kind of come back around to. So when I look at this image, I kind of immediately think sort of, uh, you know, new age Hinduism, but in fact, there is a really detailed encoding of information in this visual uh, from the uh, objects in Ganesh's hands uh, to the rat at his feet, to the position of his feet. All of these have specific meanings and references in uh, Hindu symbology that are not necessarily very familiar to me as a Western observer, but I think in a certain way they reflect the uh, potential encodings that can be obscure or confusing to our broader publics when we're, we're creating science visuals. 
So fundamentally, when we're doing science visualization, what we're doing is we're taking the ones and zeros of modern data, whether that's astronomical data or other data, geographic data, uh, really all of modern science is digital. So we're taking the ones and zeros of data and we're transforming that into imagery. Now, the ones and zeros might come from Hubble Space Telescope. So they might be uh, the ones and zeros of different images uh, with with uh, representing basically light emitted by, in this case, the Eagle Nebula at different wavelengths that are then cleaned up, transformed, color coded to represent uh, what we now recognize as a very characteristically Hubble Space Telescope uh, representation of, of an astronomical object. So this is data visualization that's, that's um, nuanced and artful, but also relatively straightforward. It's observational data that, um, uh, that is then transformed into an image. Now, I often go into digressions about computational visualizations that are, are then uh, visualized in a similar way. I'll actually come back to one of those later, but what I'd rather emphasize now is that, in fact, we can talk about this as a visualization, but in fact, almost any kind of data representation that we have is a type of visualization. So if you look at what will be familiar to anyone with an astronomy background, something like the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, this very simply represents uh, the, uh, the, the brightness and color of stars uh, graphed with its color on the uh, x-axis and its brightness on the y-axis. Uh, and these are the um, 10,000 some odd closest stars from the uh, uh, from the Hipparchus catalog. And here, uh, I'll, I'll digress a moment to, to note that uh, the color here is actually kind of an intriguing and an interactive uh, conversation. I would I would sort of ask what people think the color represents. Uh, the color here is it. There is a color bar which is good. So down here in the lower left of the of the of the graph, uh, it does indicate at least a number <laughs> for the color bar, uh, but it's not really clear, but that represents the sort of number density. Basically, the, in the red parts of the plot, we're overplotting so much data that we color code them red, whereas in the blue dots, those really represent just a single star or something like that. But that's not a very obvious color coding, so that's something that I'll come back to in a moment. Now, the same kind of concept can actually be illustrated uh, using a much more, um, you know, kind of moving from data representation into uh, kind of infographic realm. Uh, and so this can be helpful in talking about not just what the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram kind of literally states about the brightness and color of stars nearby, but also a little bit about, I mean, here we do represent individual stars as sort of these icons here, if you can read that. Uh, and then uh, and then furthermore, kind of identify groupings of supergiants and giants and the main sequences of, of stars offering a little bit more kind of fleshing out what this representation means. And there's actually a lot of layering of data in here um, that's, that's useful uh, depending on what you're trying to extract from this visual representation. So this is actually a very useful uh, representation that comes from a textbook uh, that's fundamentally illustrating the same thing uh, that we saw earlier. And then just to go even further afield, and this is where we start to, I think, kind of stray from what I call a true data visualization. There are also things like cartoons. Uh, this is sort of a, a cartoon representing the, the various stages of star formation. I like to use star formation as an example uh, because it is this time evolving process that's something that we like to talk about in our planetarium shows. And so this will be familiar uh, to anyone who's read comics that you start in the upper left and work your way to the lower right. Uh, if you're Japanese, you'd go the other direction, but at least for, uh, and, and then that's even reinforced by the A, B, C, D, E, F labeling. But this is very familiar visual encoding for people. Uh, and, and comics are, are uh, something that's actually uh, virtually global in terms of their, um, of their impact. So it's a, this sequential art is actually a, a very familiar kind of visual encoding. Um, so most of your viewers are gonna recognize this, this kind of way of arranging uh, elements of a story. But, what all of this comes back to, and so we've kind of strayed from this very straightforward like data visualization of the Hubble Space Telescope image on through graphing and, and infographics, and now straying pretty far away, but still kind of talking about visual representation. I guess the main point I want to make is that visualization fundamentally is about communication. And 
it can be communication to oneself, basically data analysis. So you can imagine that first Hertzsprung Russell diagram I showed is maybe more in that category uh, than in uh, than in these others. But it can also be communication to your peers or to expert audiences. Again, that Hertzsprung Russell diagram, or even that more infographic style. Um, uh, representation of, of, uh, of star formation of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram uh, is really for people who are, who are familiar with these encodings or people who are trying to educate about these encodings, these visual encodings, and then communication to general audiences. And I think that kind of that final uh, cartoon image, in a sense, is uh, the, the sequential art is something that's going to be familiar to broad audiences because it, it uses a visual encoding that's very familiar to people, but it kind of loops back around to that, that Hubble Space Telescope image that, um, that is in fact um, so visually compelling that, that the people become engaged with it. Uh, but the, the, the core point I'm gonna make here is that, that as with all means of communication, all visuals incorporate an element of subjectivity. There's no, such thing as an objective image. You always make choices about how data are used to represent, or how you're choosing to represent data. And so you have to be aware of that when you're, when you're making those choices, or you can kind of make, you can make mistakes that are going to cause your audience's confusion. So going back again to this ones and zeros, this is fundamentally what we're talking about. We're taking the ones and zeros of scientific data and we're transforming it into, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope image. Now going back to those kind of three different ways of communicating to uh, audiences, this image is not, this is actually the more recent uh, 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 Eagle Nebula image, not the classic 1995 Pillars of Creation image, but Jeff Hester, who was the astronomer who originally created the uh, Pillars of Creation image, color coded the different wavelengths of light um, in a very specific way. First of all, he did do what we basically all uh, have uh, adopted as a standard in, in astronomical image representation like this, which is longer wavelengths are uh, basically color coded toward the red end of the spectrum and shorter wavelengths are color coded toward the blue. Um, and uh, unfortunately my notes for this image are, are not, are, have been erased here, but uh, basically the, I believe the blue uh, color codes uh, doubly ionized oxygen, uh, which would normally be seen as kind of green. Uh, the uh, uh, yellow, I believe, is sulfur, ionized sulfur, and uh, the red is ionized nitrogen. Uh, it might be sodium, not sulfur. At any rate, uh, Jeff Hester was color coding these because he was interested in what was happening at this interface between uh, the overall kind of ionized oxygen here and these eroding columns of denser molecular gas in the star forming region. So he was color coding to get this really interesting kind of warm color uh, to understand the structure of uh, how the ionizing radiation from the star, which is located kind of above and slightly to the right of the center of this image, was interacting with these dense molecular clouds. Interestingly though, what he ended up doing was creating this wonderful sense of depth because in Western art, blue is a color that automatically that recedes because in our atmosphere, blue objects and landscapes are farther away. And so you have this wonderful sense of dimensionality, which is absolutely a coincidence or a, a, just a byproduct of uh, the, the visualization um, process and the choices that Jeff made. So Jeff was creating an image to communicate to himself, to uh, help analyze the data. But in fact, he created an image that has remarkable aesthetic appeal, in part because it conforms to expectations uh, based on centuries of Western art. So this is a way that the very subjective choices that we make can actually lead to kind of unintended consequences, in this case, very positive. But when we look at something like that Hertzsprung russell diagram and the very confusing, to my mind, representation of uh, color uh, as number density, that's not something that's gonna be familiar to most of our audiences. So when we show someone like something like this, uh, and particularly since it's not a, it's pretty, I mean, it's, a, it's not the most abstract kind of data that you can imagine about stars, but still, it's, uh, it requires some explanation. My concern is a lot of people look at this and they may look at it the same way that 
um, someone unfamiliar with Hindu iconography would look at that image that I presented earlier without understanding the encoding and the symbology of this image. Uh, and like I said, you might just look at this and think, you know, new aging Hinduism, uh, someone else might look at this and just think, yeah, sciencey stuff. So they might kind of turn off. And if we're not very explicit about the choices that we're making and trying to make visual choices that are easily understood by our audiences, I think we can create visuals that are ultimately quite confusing for our audiences. So just to give a couple examples of things where, uh, of visuals where that I think use a metaphor very effectively. One of the greatest data visualization experts around uh, is Randall Monroe, who does XKCD, the online comic. He created this visual about um, basically showing the area of different uh, hard surfaces in the solar system. And so you can see Earth easily represented by the familiar kind of uh, Earth map. Uh, and then the relative area of Venus off to the lower right, Mars directly below the Earth map, et cetera. And you get a sense of the relative areas. But what I think is really interesting is he immediately chooses, in a very, very simple way, elements that immediately communicate the idea of map. So if, you're, if you have any familiarity with kind of uh, the, not even the history of map making, but just the representation of maps that we see in popular culture, the kind of darkened line of the outer coastline, the little, uh, the radiating lines from that indicate kind of a shoreline. It just communicates island and map very, very clearly and simply. And so he uses a visual metaphor that reinforces the concept that he's trying to convey. So whereas, you know, an area and a graph could represent all kinds of different things, uh, he is explicitly saying, this is a map. This is showing you area in terms of uh, physical area of these objects. Now, a much less successful uh, example, borrowing exactly the same metaphor, is um, uh, this, uh, this map that actually comes from uh, an Australian group. Um, and uh, it's called, the group is called Unit 7. They, they basically wanted to create this map of a human brain. And so they actually went to much greater uh, lengths than Randall Monroe. They, the close-ups on, on the right-hand side show these, you know, inlets and these different kind of color uh, gradients that all borrow from like National Geographic maps and things like that. They go to great lengths to create something that's very map-like. And yet, it doesn't have any meaning as a map or as an as an area or a region or topography, it's, it's really just borrowing the metaphor to do something that's visually interesting, but not communicating anything specific about the data that they're representing this way. So whereas Randall Monroe chooses the map metaphor and does it in a very simple way, in a way that reinforces the content he's representing, uh, this one just doesn't. It's beautiful to look at, but it's really not conveying anything extra by representing it this way. So to really kind of take things back to basics, I would like to recommend just a couple books that I really like. I'm gonna breeze through these, um, but uh, you know it's recorded and we can talk about it later. Um, so first is a very simple thin book called Designing Data Visual Visualizations by Noah Alinsky. And this is super short. It's, um, uh, it's from O'Reilly. You can buy a paper copy, but I would recommend not to because it's print on demand and it's printed in black and white. So when you receive the printed copy, all of this discussion of, for example, color is completely confusing uh, because you have a black and white copy of the book. So if you do uh, want to purchase this, it's really pretty inexpensive. I highly recommend buying the electronic copy, uh, PDF or whatever. But uh, Noah outlines these very kind of simple, uh, this kind of recipe for creating data visualizations. I'm just, I'm just gonna, gonna breeze through this, but what I find interesting about it is that it mirrors some of my own thinking about um, audiences, about yourself as an audience, experts as an audience, or uh, broader uh, publics as an audience. He talks about the four pillars of visualization. Uh, so the purpose of the visualization, the content of the visualization, the structure, and then the formatting. And I think this is, um, without going into detail, very, I could talk through an example later, but uh, a very good way of approaching it. And what I like about the book is that he really takes you through this step by step. So if you want to just think through the process, and, um, and it helps when you open up the book and start thinking about it to have a specific goal in mind, come up with a specific project, a specific set of data that you would want to illustrate, 
and work through the process with it. And it's a very, um, it's a very illustrative kind of um, exercise. Noah also has a blog, which I'll um, uh, point to later. It's actually complexdiagrams.com, which you can see there at the bottom of the image. And uh, this is in the book as well. Uh, and a couple of the other references make reference to this as well. But uh, he talks about the properties and best uses of visual encoding. So you can think about things like if you're creating a graph, you can have dots can be of different sizes. Well, your visual system is very good at queuing into that. We, we know things are bigger than other things. Um, we're, we're very good at um, position and placement, things that are higher up or lower. We organize our visual system very much along those lines. Things like pattern, saturation, brightness, which is of particular importance in the planetarium dome. Uh, bright objects really stand out, uh, particularly in the darkened theater uh, of a planetarium. Uh, but something like, for example, color, which uh, because of, for example, a lot of scientists bias, uh, in thinking about the, the spectrum, we think of it as a potentially an ordered set of, uh, uh, of representations. So, you know, from red to orange, to yellow, to green, to blue, to violet. In fact, that's not an intrinsic part of our visual system. Instead, that's something it's, we've overlaid that information on, uh, on the world. So that's something that we understand not based on uh, our day-to-day -day experience, but something that we've learned over time. And it's not something that's really evolved in our visual system, uh, but is instead, again, something that we've learned. So, uh, so this table is a great kind of recipe uh, for different ways of encoding information and thinking about what's going to be immediately recognizable versus things that would uh, be, um, be second-order kind of uh, things that you would take from a visual, visual representation. And again, they could talk through lots of examples with this, but just to go back to our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, this is not an intrinsic visual representation. We choose this spectrum uh, that's used down in the lower uh, left-hand corner here as a representation because it's familiar to, uh, to people who think of light in this, of, of light color, sorry, being ordered in this, in this way, but it's not an intrinsically um, familiar way of, of, of structuring the, the data. And furthermore, uh, with a data representation like this, if I just switch to a black and white view of this image, you'll notice that the, the red dots that are in some sense the most important and have the most data, that are representing the most data, now are actually darker actually than the surrounding uh, area. And, and this is an intrinsic part of our visual system. We cue into bright things more than dim things. So, um, so we're actually competing when we use something like the rainbow color palette to, uh, to create this, something that is sort of saying, you know, red is the most important, but it's also dimmer than, for example, the yellow or the green that usually it appears in one of these uh, rainbow color palettes. So our, 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 our evolved brain is telling us one thing and our logical brain is telling us something else. And that's not uh, a recipe for a good visualization, good visual representation. WMAP is one of the Offenders on this where the red blotches there are in fact much darker than the surrounding area uh, and although that was improved with the Planck representation in terms of trying to create a more uniform color palette uh, and emphasizing that the brightest area is actually sort of the average or the mean value of the cosmic microwave background it's still um, I think Problematic, and there are people who feel about this even more strongly than I do. Uh, the end of the rainbow is something. In fact, there's even a Twitter uh, hashtag around uh, end rainbow uh, is something that is being discussed in a lot of different uh, parts of the, in this case, the climate community in the UK. Uh, but basically, looking at how the rainbow representation is counterproductive in terms of uh, conveying uh, data to uh, to broader publics. Uh, so you can read at greater length uh, about this that I'm going to mention my kind of collection of resources at the end of the talk. And um, uh, I, I point to a lot of these. Um, I will offer one example where I think that the rainbow is used to good effect. Uh, this is uh, a Hubble image that shows um, a, uh, um, uh, a galaxy uh, with redshift um, plotted in the same coordinate space projected over here on the, on the right hand side. Uh, and here the red and blue actually mean something. Oops. I don't know if you 
did you lose me there for a second or anyway um the red and green actually mean something in terms of red shift and blue shift um so it's a, it's a more meaningful representation but i just wanted to offer this as saying that there are ways to use the color uh the rainbow but but um not the way they're typically used we did lose you for a second but that's okay, okay. glad i'm back i think i've started to put my computer to sleep sorry about that uh, but i am um almost up on my 20 minutes so let me just kind of mention a couple other resources and then if we have time i can talk through uh, a couple other examples of um, data representations that we've worked on for our shows but two other books i really strongly recommend visual thinking for design by colin ware this is uh colin has two books more than two but two kind of general uh, design books that talk about visualization. There's the thick book and the thin book. This is a thin one and it's all you really need. It has uh, really, really thoughtful uh, uh, descriptions of the different ways that, that people interpret uh, visual representations of data. It's just a, it's an invaluable resource. And that's when you can buy it in paper or electronically um, because it's in color both ways. Uh, and then Nathan Yao, and, and actually a lot of these people, Nathan has a great um, uh, a website as well, uh, flowing, uh, flowingdata.com, which is actually in the lower um, left-hand corner of this, the cover of his book. He has a couple books out. Um, his books are great, but actually flowing data, uh, the, uh, the, the blog is, is, is really very useful in and of itself. You don't have to actually spend money, although, you know, even visualization experts need to make a living. So if you want to support through buying books, um, I'm sure Nathan would appreciate it. And as I said, I've collected several of these resources um, on my Visualizing Science blog. I'm not updating the blog much recently. I've gotten a little too distracted with other things, but uh, the resources page, which is just one of the two tabs uh, on, the, uh, on the website, uh, will, uh, will take you to just a kind of living collection of, uh, of links and such uh, that I'm happy to, to talk through. Uh, but, um, but it's something I'm constantly adding to as, as I find new resources and such. So I've already gone past my 20 minutes. I do have a couple of kind of examples that I could talk through as well. So we could go to Q&A or I can just kind of keep maybe another five minutes of just a couple of examples. Yeah, why don't you continue? All right. So the first example, this is, um, so this is kind of the visualization that um, has been the, the bread and butter of the work that I did at American Museum of Natural History and, and, and the astronomical visualization that we've done here at the Academy of Sciences. Um, but I wanted to kind of go back to that star formation story because uh, I like it so much. And there, for a show that we did back in 2010, uh, Life of Cosmic Story, we wanted to talk about uh, the, the, the formation of stars Actually, I'm talking over this early image of the Orion Nebula, which uh, actually is kind of appropriate for that as well. Uh, but we had agreed to work with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, and we had identified a couple sets of data. Uh, the, the largest was a data collection data set was from uh, Kritzik et al., which is a giant molecular cloud. Um, so this, the entire simulation is seen here on the left-hand side, and then we can zoom in to higher and higher concentrations, higher and higher densities, until we're seeing from the scale of the giant molecular cloud down to the scale of an individual uh, stellar system forming. So it's a remarkable data set. Uh, it's adaptive mesh refinement, which means that it's being calculated at different scales, depending on how much activity is going on. It's challenging to visualize. That's why we wanted to work with uh, NCSA. And this is the kind of, um, I'll call it a press release kind of uh, image that might accompany this. It's, um, you know, we're, we're simply looking at the density here. Uh, and, um, and I think this is even, this is actually just, a, these are actually just slices through uh, the data. So, you know, brighter areas are denser, darker areas are less, less dense. Uh, but in fact, these are trimolecular clouds, they're dark. If you were to actually look at them uh, in the uh, in the galaxy, you don't see bright glowing regions unless you're looking in like infrared. Um, so this is a little deceptive in terms of uh, what you would actually what you would actually see. When NCSA created the initial uh, visualization uh, of this data set, uh, we got something like this. Now, 
the um, I actually don't, I was looking to see what the color coding here represents. I believe it's simply density, uh, but, uh, but basically this is, a, this is a beautiful visualization uh, and we're kind of zooming into uh, the, uh, the dense region where uh, a solar system is actually forming. But the color isn't actually particularly meaningful. It creates uh, an aesthetically appealing uh, look, but and we played around with making something perhaps like I, the idea of turning on infrared eyesight and seeing something maybe more like this previous image. Um, but we weren't sure that our audiences were actually going to pull any additional sort of information from this kind of representation. So we actually sort of backed off and did something more basic. Uh, this is, although it's not maybe not immediately obvious, this is actually a view of our galaxy uh, kind of uh, almost edge on. So uh, we're looking here toward the center of the galaxy. In the show, we're following a flight path that's taking us through these giant molecular clouds uh, that kind of trace out the Milky Way spiral arms. And we actually embrace this idea of talking about how planets are formed in these dark parts of the galaxy. Uh, so when we, this is the same data simulation from Kritzik, and you can actually see uh, that bright region here is where a planetary system is forming. And you can see that we retained a little bit of that blue kind of um, color to articulate the edges of the dark cloud, but really embrace the idea of sort of thinking of this as kind of a, not really photoreal, but sort of embracing the idea that we want to mirror what you'd actually see uh, in, the, uh, in the galaxy if you look at these regions where stars are forming. And then when we approach the actual uh, region where the solar system and our story is forming, uh, we come up on a separate simulation of a, uh, of a forming planetary system. Uh, and this is, again, not really photoreal. It's kind of, this is kind of getting into, um, you know, an artistically informed choice to make something that's very readable in the dome uh, and, and sort of aesthetically pleasing while following some kind of general guidelines around uh, the physical representation of the object. And then just to choose a couple quick, very much simpler examples, uh, this is from our show Habitat Earth. Um, so instead of trying to visualize a whole three-dimensional data set and with all these kind of complicated bells and or knobs to twiddle, here we're, we're really showcasing simply two data sets. One uh, is the, the, what we see on the land and sea in this image, which is net primary productivity. It's basically a measure of how quickly uh, plant life, whether that's plant life in the oceans or algae in the oceans or trees on the land, uh, how quickly plant life is turning uh, solar energy into living material. And superimposed on top of that are these kind of yellowish lines uh, showing the migration of uh, birds. Um, and I can't remember where this comes from, either flying south or flying north uh, to follow uh, the changing seasons. And uh, the important point to recognize here is that the color representation that, for example, uh, NOAA used in showing the same net primary productivity data uh, was, um, uh, first of all, because it was designed for print, was darker where more photosynthesis was taking place, uh, but it treated the land and the sea as, as the same. Um, here, we tried to simplify it by creating uh, brightness. Again, our eye is drawn by brightness, particularly in a dark planetarium dome. And just keeping the bright areas of the ocean and bright areas of the land uh, representing where the most activity is taking place. And then just using a uniform color for the trajectories of the life forms that are traversing this landscape. So trying to keep this as simple as possible so that it, in the context of the show, as this visual goes by fairly rapidly, people can hopefully understand what is going on. Similarly, when we showed, in this case, airline flights, so creating a contrast between the natural system of uh, birds migration uh, and the uh, human system of airlines crisscrossing uh, the planet in a matter of hours, where of course migrations take place over the course of a year and the seasonal changes that are driven by uh, our planet's interaction with the sun. We, uh, we also chose a more artificial kind of color for the representation for plane flights. Uh, and then in the background we put, instead of the star field, we put um, 
plane schedules and kind of referenced uh, sort of this automated uh, human uh, influence. And then uh, as my last example, another just, again, just sort of simplifying things so that we could communicate things as, uh, as clearly as, as possible and as simply as possible in the context of a show it's, that's going by relatively quickly. This is a snapshot from our show Earthquake where we talk about the 1906 earthquake that of course devastated San Francisco. And here we're showing the uh, a kind of uh, faded down map of the Bay Area with San Francisco toward the center. The red is, although it's not quite as clear in this 2D representation because we're looking at one frame of a movie of frames, is the surface of Earth and the red shows shaking on Earth's surface. The yellow shows, uh, uh, which we selected because it kind of shows up nicely uh, through that red surface, is actually slip along the fault plane uh, as the San Andreas Fault slipped over the course of 90 seconds uh, and, uh, and the, fault, uh, the fault slip spread from uh, an epicenter just off the uh, west coast of San Francisco on up and down the San Andreas Fault for a distance of totaling about uh, 300 miles. Uh, so rather than trying to do a, a complex color coding on Earth's surface or on the, on the fault plane, we chose very simple uh, yellow to white for the slip and just red for the, uh, uh, for the surface shaking and a way to communicate it as, as simply and as effectively as possible. But one of the kind of closing thoughts I wanted to end with is, um, you know, in, in most Western societies, uh, red is clearly associated with danger, uh, and yellow uh, is kind of this warning color. Uh, so it works really well for us. In fact, um, red and yellow have different meanings in different cultures. So we're kind of, even in this, this representation that we're trying to choose as simple and as readable as possible, uh, we're opening ourselves up to uh, communicating different messages depending on uh, really your cultural background and uh, what you grew up thinking of red and for example, in Chinese culture, red is uh, is positive, uh, good luck, uh, and and so um, it's a little bit different from the meaning that's intended here. So that's my kind of rapid fire um, personal perspective on visualizing uh, different data sets for planetariums and more broadly. Uh, this is my contact info. You certainly feel free to drop me an email, uh, or you can find me on Twitter. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, visualizingscience.rymy.net is my blog that doesn't really get too much attention now, but the resource page uh, is something I update fairly regularly. So with that, I'd love to have a discussion and go from here. Uh, <clears throat> wow, thanks a lot, Ryan. Uh, just, I'm gonna stop the recording and then restart, because uh, just to, 